Hey Foss Church, hope you're doing well this Sunday evening. Uh, we will be singing a song called The Blessing and I would love for you to join.
Welcome to Sacramento Reality. Sacrament is one of those words that we've heard or we think we know, but we cannot always define when we're asked. But sacraments historically have been those moments or those events that have a little extra grace, has that place that we experience God. And today we'll be stepping into the sacrament of listening. When we think of listening and spirituality, our minds are drawn towards the fantastical, towards listening prayers, which end in direct communication from God. Asking about these communications, though, the conversation becomes vague. It becomes, I had a feeling, a peace, a compulsion, a leaning. And yet the book of Acts is replete with direct communication, where God shows up to protect Paul, rescue Peter, and teleport Philip after baptizing a eunuch. Yet when we reach Acts 15, something switches. A moment when you would expect divine communication, when you would think the God who has shown up throughout the book would speak to the apostles who are in the middle of a debate about what they should do with the traditions that have brought them to Jesus. Yet, God was silent and the community was given the sacrament of listening through the gift of disagreement. But God was silent and the community was given the sacrament of listening through the gift of disagreement. In 15.2, we come into Paul and Barnabas had a major argument and debate with Pharisees who said it was a necessity to observe the laws of Moses. The church appointed Paul and Barnabas and some others from among them to go to meet with the apostles and elders in Jerusalem about this point of disagreement. It wasn't a word from God that resolved it. It was a community gathered together where it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us, where it was reasoned, dialogued, and then liberated from the traditional view of fill in the blank, the traditional view of the community, the traditional view of relationships, whichever traditional views that we try to go to immediate defense of. For them, it was freedom from the ethnic codes which acted as signs of old boundaries. The original disciples trusted God with them to allow them to redefine what it means to be faithful. The future was open to reorganize and to recognize where new life was being born. This happens because of heuristic community being open, a community that's open to experimenting and seeing new places of growth, not just a historical reading being defended. The apostles witnessed new life as they listened to the experiences of the Gentiles those who should be outside. To hear, they had to allow room for the traditional Pharisee to face the new community. To change, they could not simply pick up their things and leave. They couldn't choose their tradition over the new community. The sacrament of listening required them to stay in this moment with new people. New people rereading their sacred traditions traditions which had to bend so that the new voices would have room to cultivate life. And all of this, the debate, the change to historical, literal, and timeless readings, brings growth from sitting in the Gentiles' experience while muting the tradition and the traditional answers so that the new voices could be heard. All of this seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us because God trusts us to discover new life through listening to the experiences which critique, which disagree, which found life outside of our own stories. The grace of listening is experienced as a response to inclusion, which shakes the very foundations of a defensive posture. So as we step into the text of Acts 15, where Megan is going to walk us through the story, let us listen to where we find ourselves in the story in the narrative. So in Acts 15, uh, we are set upon the scene of the early church where an important disagreement with opposing views emerges within the first generation of believers. Coming from Judea, a group of believers start teaching among the family of believers that unless you are circumcised, just like Moses instructed us to, you are not saved. As you can imagine, this message, which directly contradicts what the apostles had been teaching about being saved by faith, would cause a lot of uncertainty within new believers, especially for the growing group of Gentiles 
who had chosen to accept the gospel, particularly from Antioch, which is a little uh, more north from Jerusalem. They did not grow up with this tradition. They came with their own cultural understandings. And up until that point, they could come as they were in their acceptance of this faith. But these new believers who were claiming that they needed to become circumcised were not only giving a message of salvation being based on works, but they were also preaching a message of assimilation. You must become like us or you will not belong. Our tradition is dominant, elite, and superior, and others need to become like us. Previously at this point, uh, these Gentiles had been accepted into the family of God. They had experienced the work of the Holy Spirit, bringing them into the family of the believers, united by the gospel. But now these pro-circumcision defenders come in with the message that not only are these Gentiles other, but they do not belong. Now they are on the other side of the fence, unless they do as they say and become like them. Those who argued for circumcision, like I said, had the superior and essential tradition. If anyone else wanted to be accepted, they needed to submit to their tradition and belief system. After what I'm sure was probably many passionate debates and discussions, the church from Antioch sends its representatives, Paul, Barnabas, and others, to present their case to the elders so that the community could make a unified decision on what was the best way forward. In this Jerusalem council, stories of these Gentiles, the others and marginalized within the early generations of believers are brought forward by the representatives and elders who become their advocates. And they all have to together listen. They listen to stories of the Gentiles faith and the stories of evidence of God's movement within their communities. They have to listen to stories of their acceptance of the gospel and how God has made no distinction between them and those who grew up in the Jewish tradition. It was also brought up how it was hypocritical to ask Gentiles to meet a standard that many of those from the Jewish tradition could not meet themselves. They had to listen to the ways that they had been hypocritical. They had to listen to the stories of others. After thorough communal listening and sharing, the council came to the conclusion that many had already believed before, the Gentiles are already accepted in their current tradition, and they do not have to conform to the Jewish tradition to be so. God can communicate through their culture and tradition in the same way. After listening to these stories fellow, uh, of fellow family members of faith, um, and also listening to scripture from the past, the stories of the past, they decide to validate that the Gentiles they decide to validate the Gentiles' acceptance into the family without the condition of circumcision. There was enough grace for people of different backgrounds to be brought in. So as a result, they write a letter to the Gentiles validating their place as brothers and sisters, and they also send others back to their community to continue to build and to continue to practice the sacrament of listening. The story is an example of not only how we should come together and listen to one another in order to make decisions and discern truth, but it also shows how important listening is in the face of disagreement so that the voices of the marginalized and others don't get snuffed out in the process. So here we're going to continue the practice of the sacrament of listening uh, by entering into discussion about this passage. So there are many ways that listening is used in this passage. Um, the more I read it, the more different forms of listening stood out. Uh, one in particular that I didn't catch till kind of at my end of sitting with the passage was how at the very beginning, um, the apostles make a decision to choose to listen to the people mm -hmm. who were uh, bringing up this argument that they needed to be circumcised. They chose to listen to people that had an opposing view um, and that disagreed with them. And if they didn't choose to listen, um, they might have never gone through this journey of bringing in this issue into community and working together on, uh, instead of excluding others, how do we accept them into the family of God? 
Um, and as you were talking, you described it as the gift of disagreement. And I think that was really beautiful. Um, and I, I think that listening to disagreements are a really important part of continuing to bring us together as a community authentically. I like where you said um, for the apostles, they had to choose to listen because often, especially coming from our context where um, Christianity has kind of a survivor's tale for our story, we're always scared of this other getting us, that we realize that we do have positions as power brokers, community gatekeepers, and these voices that are powerless, the ones that can't be heard, actually do not have the ability to demand the right to be heard. So the sacrament of listening is to be able to experience the grace of the other person's voice in that situation. And to me, what's kind of unique there is the Pharisees, who are the ones pushing against that some from the schools of the Pharisees, were actually put between the position of listening to their sacred text that had certain very explicit outlines, and the stories of the Gentiles who said, we experience God, and they said, you cannot, uh, like you said, without the assimilation. And I, without that assimilation, without becoming like us, you couldn't experience God, but it was in that moment that they had to choose which one got the primary voice, the people or the text. And in this, it seemed like it was good with the Holy Spirit in them to say the people who experienced God got the final voice of inclusion. Um, the notion that usually what you get pushed back on for new readings is it was okay for the apostles because the Holy Spirit, but it's not okay for us because we have the completed text, and so it's the final word. And it's a historical finished word for a historically situated Holy Spirit that apparently never wanted to get out of the first century. So yeah, how do we invite, actually in this, in this story, how do we invite the Pharisee to stay in the room? Because the Pharisee is the one who said, that's not how Moses is read. And for anyone who would listen to that, um, would have a knee-jerk reaction because we don't hear Pharisee as a place of honor. We hear that as an insult. So to say, no, these ones who read the best, who had the best education, the best understanding, the best access to learning, um, had to choose to stay in the room with the one who said, but I experienced God here. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's good. I think we have to realize that the, the Word of God, as the Word of God, is a continuing conversation. You know, it's not a sentence with a period. It's it's continuing, and I think most people would agree that there are many things that we are still hoping for. There are stories that are not yet finished, and because of that, we're still in dialogue. We're still in conversation, and we still have to choose to listen to each other, even when we disagree. Um, I think that this isn't just a a certain instance where they decided in something that's now an authoritative sort of belief for us, but it's a template for how we should continue to listen to each other in community, um, mm -hmm. bringing our disagreements together, um, choosing to listen to different perspectives and arrive together somewhere. Uh, I like that for the community travel, um, for me to keep the person in the conversation would be following Richard Hayes's hermeneutic of trust. He said, just like we trust, the Holy Spirit was with the apostles who wrote things and with the community that followed the apostles and been with the church throughout the eons. We trust now that as we gather in community, that we still hear the Spirit of God speak to us. And like you said, um, it's not a period. It's more like my father's text messages. They're always an ellipsis because you know he's going to say more or he's a boomer and doesn't realize it's not a period. Either way though, it's that idea that there's gonna be more added that we have the answer for now, but not forever. And we, we have the freedom because of God with us, not in spite of, because of God with us. We have the freedom to say that the story is gonna be expansive. So there are probably many times that I'm even still not aware of um, where I haven't listened, but I think for me, Oh, one clear example would just be when I started to learn about other Christian traditions. I grew up in a four square church for majority, or pretty much all of my life, and I didn't know um, 
how other traditions operated until I went to college and started learning like, oh, there are all these other different ways to worship and gather. Um, and it was a long process of me learning to realize that my tradition isn't the only way. Um, I think particularly in my relationship with my fiance who grew up in an Armenian Orthodox and Catholic environment, there were a lot of times where I felt like, no, the way that I knew was better, the way that I knew was right. And I had to, over time in many discussions where I listened and he spoke and I spoke and he listened, uh, I got to learn the beauty of the other side um, and how the body of Christ um, is, is very expansive and there are many different traditions and God moves through all of them. I would resonate very much with your story for the sake that I have found it hardest to not have that defensive positioning when I hear other Christians or other traditions that weren't my own. Because when you're not from my faith tradition, when you're outside Christianity, there's not that guttural response. But when it was people who almost would be like a different flavor of vanilla than me, you know, I'm regular vanilla, you're French vanilla. And suddenly it's like, no, this is what cannot happen. And I couldn't hear your beauty. I couldn't hear your story. I couldn't hear where you found value because I was so focused on saying that wouldn't be my reading. And it, it was brought to the forefront with me, a friend of mine who is a Lutheran priest. And he went to a conference like, hey, can we grab a drink afterwards? And I sat down, he's like, wow, I didn't know evangelicals actually still talked about this. And in my world, evangelicalism is almost everything. Um, and he's like, yeah, you guys, you guys are still debating this? Like that's been played out for 160 years. And he looked dumbfounded as he stared at me. I was like, oh, you mean we don't have to have these fights? Huh. And it, it was those moments that I found those closest to me I couldn't hear. Those mm -hmm. farthest from me I could give room because their experience was so foreign mm -hmm. that I had to listen. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's a question that you could sit with for days. Um, listening as an act of grace. Uh, as much as I, I don't want this to be the example that's popping up in my head right now, I think uh, I immediately think of my relationship with my parents mm -hmm. um, and how even though they raised me in the church and, and gave me a foundation of an understanding of God since I was a kid, as we've grown, as I've grown up, I've seen the huge differences between um, the faith that they now have and the faith that mine has grown into. Um, and uh, it's caused a lot of tension along the way. Um, but I think there have been moments, especially with the current conversation of what's happening here in the United States, where we are choosing to listen to our experiences, um, where I'm on the receiving end of the listening and so are they. Uh, and it's hard. I don't think it, sometimes there's this, uh, this belief that, you know, you listen once and everything's gonna be okay, but it has to be, there's this co commitment to continued listening. Um, and as we're engaging with that, I've been experiencing grace in our relationship and, um, also grace in just both of our understandings of how God is working. I like that use you had of, of the notion of almost a reciprocal act of listening, that it's, it's a responsive place, that as you invest yourself to the sacrament of listening to your parents and their experience, it frees them to also listen to yours, rather than making it directional that one has to happen first. And I'd say um, for myself, where I've experienced the grace of listening. Uh, honestly, a majority has been grad school and seminary because my upbringing was a fairly isolated, so there was difference, but not very much of it. Like we thought Baptists and Foursquare were worlds apart, and that was kind of the entire spectrum of what difference could be. We right. heard of other people, just never met one. Mm -hmm. um, when I moved to Hawaii, since it was that much different that I was kind of, um, a you know drop of white and all the tan pictures easy to pick me out but I was so different that I didn't get that mixture of hearing but as I went into the grad schools and I got to experience people dedicated to study from all walks of life that sat they're like oh um, how did you get there and they just sat with me 
And then they trusted me enough that the sacrament of listening, I don't think we often realize, is an act of trust from the other person to be heard. Because if they don't think they can be heard, it's a great risk for them to share something raw and natural and not to move in a defensive posture. And as they shared their story, their pain, their struggle in pursuit of who Jesus is, um, that's what gave me a wider, more inclusive understanding of what the church could be. And it was those moments of grace that made life a little richer and more colorful and more expansive that said life could be bigger than I imagined because I always thought you had to keep it tight and kind of delimited pretty, pretty um, strictly. That showed me the, a, a true notion of sacrament, a true notion of extra grace of God in the other person because they shared their story in a way that actually expanded my own and made me realize mine was still important but in kind of the mosaic, the weave, the tapestry that blended with theirs, not excluded or pulled out the threads from theirs. So within FOS, we want to be able to make the space to honor by purposely delimiting ourselves a bit. Um, often we don't hear or we don't have the ability to listen because we're, we're so quick to try to fill in somebody else's story. And filling in those blanks usually pulls their story closer to my own and if I really want to experience it, I can't tame it by making it just a, a slight hue difference from mine. I have to experience it as fully other, as fully different. And in that difference say, you know, there's parts of this I won't understand and be okay with that. And then ask curious questions, be able to say, wow, like name those points. I didn't understand that. I can't get there. Can you help me hear it? And in those moments, I think we'll create a culture not of defensive posturing and trying to create boundaries, but this expansive point to where our stories can echo into each other and create more of a symphony that defines the grace of God. That's good. Thanks, Glenn. Um, I think one thing that comes to mind for me is uh, kind of how Glenn was bringing up the idea that it's listening is an act of trust uh, and trust is required. Um, so what, what does it mean to become a trustworthy listener? Uh, what are the different, um, what is the different internal uh, work? Sorry, I'm phrasing this wrong. What are the different ways that you need to work internally uh, to become a more trustworthy listener? How can you as an individual become a safe space for others? And I think we really have to look inside ourselves um, and, and think about and reflect on the different ways that maybe we are not at that spot yet uh, because all we can really control is, is ourselves and, and how we enter into the conversations and I think as we continue to sort of invest in the reputation of our ability to listen, of the integrity of our listening, um, we will become people that people flock to, to be heard, because they, they know those people will listen to me. Um, I think the more you engage in listening, the more you get the reputation of an advocate, and you will almost be a beacon of light for people who are uh, continuously uh, unheard um, and they, they will come to you to be heard because I think it's a very um, very intrinsic human need to have someone listen and hear you. So if I'm hearing you well in this, you're saying one of the ways that folks can actually become this place of um, practicing the sacrament of listening is focusing on our ability to create relational trust with people and in creating relational trust, stories will just start pouring out because they know that this is a place for process as opposed to answer. Yes, um, I think I think it's part of what it means to be human to to listen and to share your story. Both mm. of those, um, as you're saying, the the reciprocity of that, both of those sides um, are are part of the human experience. And I think when you engage in one, the other comes um, very naturally. As we strove to unpack the sacrament of listening, we've discovered that the key to listening is being able to delimit yourself enough to give space and comfort to the people trying to be heard. And if you, op if you operate from a position of power or gatekeeping, 
It actually becomes your opportunity to use your position well to be able to amplify the voices of the unheard. And in this way, we'll be able to experience the grace of God in the ever-growing, expanding kingdom that has room for each person at the table.